the expanding presence of social media in our lives and the abundance of technology, there has been a struggle to maintain what makes us, us. People's obsession with aesthetic, the existence of microtrends, and people getting the same surgeries. Everyone is starting to look alike. While things may look different today, maintaining our own individual styles and personalities is not a new phenomenon. In the 1950s, the nuclear family, the expansion of the suburbs, and the Eisenhower presidency pushed conformity onto Americans. While today's subject can be viewed from different ideologies and fears, as well as simply being viewed for entertainment, we are focusing on the dangers of conformity and invasion of the body snatchers. Hello, and thank you for joining me today on The Quiet Riot. If you are new here, this is where we talk film, television, and media. I'm Ainsley, and I just want to give a big like rest in paradise to Donald Sutherland, who actually starred in the 1973 adaptation of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, as well as Shelley Duvall, and I just feel like there's so many people who has been passing away recently. There was a really big producer that did as well. I'm sorry, I cannot think of his name off the top of my head. Um, I should have I should have thought about that prior. But there are so many people who are the reasons why, why our favorite television shows and movies are made. So a big shout out to all those people in the industry, especially those that do the thinkless jobs. You are amazing and you're the reason why movies and television exist. Today's topic is one I've wanted to talk about for quite a while now. Last Halloween season, I ended up watching a lot of 1950s movies for the first time, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers was not one that I had saw for the first time, so I didn't really get around to doing it. But based on a lot of things that have been going on and happening both in my personal life as well as just things that have been happening in the world, I thought that this would be a great topic to tackle this year, and I finally got around to it. I did end up reading the book for the first time actually by Jack Finney, and I didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed the movie, though I do think there are certain aspects of the book that uh, are quite entertaining and it is a pretty good read. I do recommend it if you just want something that's kind of, you know, it's it's pulp fiction really and it's a quite easy and quick read. I listened to the audiobook version and I really did like the audiobook. I will actually put the version that I listened to in the description box below if you're interested and that's where you will also find anything that I read in preparation for this video. So without further ado, let's get started and discuss Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Originally published in serial as The Body Snatchers, Jack Finney's novel is a pulp science fiction novel written to entertain readers. Shortly after its release in 1955, a film was made adapting the, the source material rather faithfully. There were changes, mostly at the behest of producers. Daniel Mannering adapted the novel with Don Sakal coming in to direct. Invasion of the Body Snatchers has been viewed as many things in the years since its release. Mannering, whose proletariat story was published under his own name, and whose novel Build Your Gallows High was adapted into Out of the Past, went much deeper with the material. It's no doubt that Invasion of the Body Snatchers means something. Whether you're looking at it through the lens of 1950s America or from a modern world view, Invasion of the Body Snatchers reflects the ordinary with something rather extraordinary. Since the original novel's publication, there has been at least four movies adapted from the original source material and then several other films that have taken the original source material as inspiration. Each film tends to reflect the time that they are made in. In the 1950s, Body Snatchers takes place in a small town, with the 70s adaptation moving to the city. The 90s film, The Body Snatchers, was based on a military base, and The Invasion, released in the 2000s, follows two people who find a virus on an aircraft and are the only pair aware of it. It's easy to view the film as pure entertainment, and if that's why you watch films and you prefer just to do it as simply an escape, this is definitely a movie for you. 
But if you also like to look into your films and you find a different kind of connection with them and you like to look a little deeper, Invasion of the Body Snatchers also allows you to do that. Invasion of the Body Snatchers was made during the McCarthy era, leading many to believe that it was an allegory for McCarthyanism as the danger as well as the dangers to turning a blind eye to it. Even if the film was originally made as entertainment only, that doesn't mean it hasn't grown to mean something. The source material and its first film follow a small town doctor who investigates the strange occurrences in his hometown. He soon finds out that aliens have invaded and are replacing the humans with replicas. A simple yet strong premise that manages to have a theme whether it was meant to have one or not. At the time of the film's release, the director stated the film was simple entertainment. Don Segal commented, however, in 1980, the political reference to Senator McCarthy and totalitarianism was inescapable. But I try not to emphasize it because I feel that motion pictures are primarily to entertain and did not want to preach. While I do understand the fact that Motion pictures is also a really big part of entertainment. Film is an art form, and so it can often reflect fears, anxieties of the time, as well as just various things that are happening in the world. And you could have a film that maybe, maybe takes place in the past, it's a period piece, and while that film is dealing with subject matter from a different time, it is also reflecting realities of our current time. And art is subjective, including in film form, so I really like to watch certain films, particularly sci-fi and horror, and find something uh, a little deeper inside of it, and that's what I've done with Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I will be looking at the 1970s version at some point as well, and we will talk about those, compare them a little bit, as well as comparing them to the original source material. The film could easily be perceived as an allegory for communism, but it works more as an allegory for capitalism, colonialism, and their effects. The pod people go from planet to planet, incorporating the various life forms into themselves. Conformity, another symptom of imperialism, is seen from the beginning as Dr. Miles Bunnell begins to notice the changes to the townspeople around him. People are beginning to lack what makes them them. They no longer have personalities that differentiate them from each other. In the film, William Lenz, played by Virginia Christine, mentions she knows that her uncle is not her uncle because of his eyes. His features are all the same, but his eyes are different. There is no feeling. When somebody talks about something they like, love, they enjoy, their face tends to light up, their eyes tend to express something, some kind of emotion, and I always think that the eyes are the windows to the soul of that saying, and whether or not you believe in a soul or not, I think it's pretty for most people, a lot of what they're feeling comes across in their face, and even if it doesn't, it's really hard to hide those feelings from your eyes, and the thought of somebody not having any type of expression there is creepy. What the pod people are doing isn't easy to cover up, because they are getting rid of these attributes that make us human. They don't want to blend in either. They want to replace us. One of the things that makes the film great is that it can be reminiscent of various ideologies depending on how you view it. From the mind of Daniel Mannering, whose short story he adapted into The Lawless, I don't expect that his work isn't going to criticize the realities of the time. By this point, he had already been doing that in his work. Unfortunately, many of the realities that Daniel Mannering discussed in both the books and films that he wrote didn't stop existing in the 1950s. It's no wonder the film has inspired multiple adaptations since its release in 1956. The film starts as Dr. Miles Bunnell is screaming in a hospital outside of his town, and a doctor comes up to him and allows him to tell his story. This scene was added after they had already done the rest of the film. They wanted to do a bookend scene, and this was more so at the behest of the producers. This wasn't a want for either Seagull or Mannering, and I will talk more about this once we get to the end of this video, but I just don't think it was a good idea to put this in there. I didn't hate it, but 
it just, it, I think it did a bit of a disservice to the film overall. We are then told what happened and the film is told in flashback by Miles Bennell as Dr. Bennell returns to his hometown of Santa Maria, California after his nurse called him back following many patients need to see him. On his way back to the office with the nurse, he runs into a boy who was acting scared and erratic and the boy ends up running off and the grandmother tells him that he is just, that he just didn't want to go to school that day. And Bennell lets this go, but he still feels that something is a little off. When he gets to his office, his nurse realizes that a lot of the appointments have been canceled. He did mention that his former girlfriend had returned to town and she has gotten a divorce and he's divorced there. So, you know, this is the 1950s. It's, you gotta add a little like romance in there. There's gotta be some romance. And luckily the romance itself doesn't really take away from the film at all. And when she arrives to his place of work, she tells him about her cousin Wilma and the fact that she believes that their uncle is not actually their uncle. And then he goes to see her and she tells him that it's in his eyes that she can't tell. Eventually it's kind of just uh, rubbed off or like shrugged off and the two end up going on a date but that date is short-lived when they are called to their friend's house where Jack and Teddy have found a body in their basement that's laying on her pool table and it is a replica but it doesn't really have any distinct features but it's like shape and body type are reminiscent of Jack. There's a run-in with a psychiatrist that nips some of the worries that Benel has in the bud basically by saying that there's some kind of mass hysteria going on. Benel and Becky eventually leave the couple's place and he takes her back to her father's and then he goes to his place. Back at the Bellex house, the duplicate turns into the spitting image of Jack. They leave and head to Jack's. When they ask about Becky, Benel gets nervous and heads over to her house where he finds a duplicate of her. When she won't get up, he carries her out and takes her to his house. Benel, Jack, and their doctor eventually head over to his house and find that the duplicate of Jack is no longer there. They then head over to Becky's house where there is no duplicate and where they are also caught by his father who called the cops or Becky's father who then called the cops and he lets them know that a corpse without fingerprints was actually found. The Bullocks eventually leave with a plan to leave the town at Santa Marie and come back with help. Becky decides to stay behind with Bunnell despite his own chagrin. They go to her house to find that multiple that, that multiple people are there, including her dad, Wilma, and others that are changed. They are caught but run and the duplicates are now on the lookout. The pair then head to the clinic where they plan to stay up all night so the duplicates can't form. Apparently, the while people are sleeping is when the duplicates are forming or they're somehow getting their life out of that. Early the next morning, the townspeople all change together in the town square. Jack shows up with the doctor, but he is no longer Jack. And you're reborn into an untroubled world. Where everyone's the same. Exactly. What a world. This is my favorite scene in the movie, where they're all in the clinic, and you've got Benel and Becky together, and then you've got Jack and the doctor, and they're having this conversation and the psychiatrist ends up saying, love, desire, ambition, faith, without them, life's so simple. And something that I find great about this movie in particular is that it really makes us think about some of the stuff that can make life definitely more difficult at times. And but uh, it also makes life interesting. Like just imagine if you didn't have those things, it would be boring, boring. The pair are tied up but eventually get free and go on the run. They make their way to a cave where Becky eventually falls asleep. When he tries to wake her, it is apparent that she has now changed. Benel runs and makes his way out of town. The duplicates allow him to go because he won't be believed. 
The original ending was more bleak. There was just plans to have him running, saying they're here, they're here. But unfortunately, thanks to the producer Wagner, he wished for a happier ending. Seagal and Mannering didn't want this, but they ended up Cade adding the book in scenes. And the ending does work, but um, I do personally think that the bleaker alternative would have worked better with this film because while there is still, while it is still pretty bleak, there is not this like solid idea of what's happening. You don't know uh, what's happening elsewhere in the world, what could possibly change and make things better. And I know in the source material, there is more of a happy ending, um, happier than what this film gets and then, but I just think having that sense of, of searching for hope as opposed to uh, having a more solid hope, I guess. I don't know if that's the best uh, term to use, but uh, yeah, having a better idea of what's going to happen as opposed to a more open ending. I do think it did a bit of a disservice to this film, unfortunately, but it's still in it as a whole. I, the film does work quite beautifully. There are moments throughout where we sit with a character in their confusion or fear, and the next time we see them, all that has disappeared. From a modern perspective, this is great interpretation of toxic positivity, as opposed to a more positive outlook that allows you your anger, frustration, etc. While my perspective comes from the present times, there are so many ways to connect with the material. While the world has evolved in certain areas and in different ways, there is still a lot of conformity, intentional and not, that occurs in the world. The desire to fit in with the masses shaped the 1950s. From pop culture to presidency, conforming was a way of life. Take a look at the sitcoms, advertisements, and the ideals of the period. The nuclear family in a house in the suburbs with a picket fence. It was a time of smile and act like nothing is wrong. The invasion of the body snatchers challenges the idea that conformity is better and that what makes us human isn't really worth it. There are aspects of both the film and book that remind me of The Stepford Wives. I am currently reading The Stepford Wives as well. I've been kind of moving through it. It's a, it's a short book, but I've been moving through it slowly because I'm reading a few different things. And I also really love the 1970s adaptation of that. I will be eventually doing that on this channel as well. But there were certain aspects of it that really reminded me because there are similar themes that are explored and there's that critique of conformity and really the critique of, when you look from the 1970s perspective, which is when The Separate Wives was made and the specific things were going on, there was this need or this want that some people had to go back to the 1950s. And there was, you know, obviously the pushback. And I think both of these films uh, represent that that pushback of this is how we want it, this is how it's got to be, and this is what it's going to look like. I personally enjoy Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and it's one of those films that I will recommend to everybody because I am i don't expect everyone to like it, but I know different people might be able to take something different from it. It's a quick movie, it's entertaining, it's fast-paced, and it's also great entertainment or something that can really inspire some conversations among friends and family. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch and or listen to me ramble on about conformity in Invasion of the Body Snatchers. If you haven't watched this film before or you have and you'd just like to watch it again, where you can find it will be in the description box below along with my resources and any other links that you may want to find here on the channel or where you can find me elsewhere. I do have some plans for some upcoming videos. The scripts are already written. I just have to film them. I will be doing some that have been requested of me. I'm really excited to do those. I am, like I said, I'm reading a few different things right now, one of which is The Stepford Wives for a future video, and one is actually The Lord of the Flies for a future video, and then like watching the movies as well. But if there's anything that you would ever like to see on this channel, please let me know in the comments below. If you haven't already, subscribe and ring the bell to be notified every single time I post. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and I'll see you next time. Bye!